Okay, uh, this is the top five problems in horses, um, eye problems. Um, and when I put this together, that was the working title. And I came up with about 15 problems in horses' eyes. And it's always a little bit more complicated than it seems because when you take a topic such as eyes in general, there are so many things that can go wrong. And I just want to make sure that I can um, do them right. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, this as the horse talk. I always do this little section here to introduce myself. And the reason is you who are tuning in need to know that I'm here, but I know that most people run a little bit late. And I appreciate all of you get here at 7 o'clock. I can't tell you how much I love starting on time. But there are some people who like to just take their time, mosey in, things are happening, the dog needs to go out, they need to pop another beer, pour another glass of wine, or just grab a cup of coffee, whatever you need. Uh, and some people are, um, just do that. So this is the obligatory five-minute spiel about the horse talk, part of the horse's advocate. And if you're not a member of the horsesadvocate.com yet, please become a member. It's free. And when you sign up, you're going to get a free copy of the 10 Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship in a PDF format. Uh, download straight into your computer. All right. And the website, I, I keep redoing it. If you've been there a week ago, it's different than last week. Uh, I'm trying to make it more uh, usable and accessible. And my goal between the next, uh, before the end of the year, December 31st, is to revamp every page that's out there, make the pictures even better. I'm working constantly on them, trying to make them better for people, uh, adding content so you can understand what the pictures are saying. It is definitely a work in pro progress. But Horse Talk webcasts are something I do the first Sunday of every month at 7 o'clock to talk about something that I think is important. So if you go to the horseadvocate.com forward slash horse talk, you will see all the webcasts that I've done so far, which is over a year now, and all the ones that are coming up in the future. I also um, have Horse Sense, which are little five-minute spiels. I've got more of them than, the, than are on the website, so they're coming. Ask Talk T sessions, articles, and recordings, and everything. All I want to do is help you become the horse's advocate. But I do require membership because I want you to understand that I'm not your veterinarian. Um, it's just an entertainment site. It's to give you some information so you can become a better communicator with your veterinarian and your professionals uh, so you can um, make better decisions. So who am I? Well, I'm Doc T. I'm Jeff Tucker, DVM. And uh, Horse Advocate is the learning center of the equine practice, which is the overriding um, company that we represent. Uh, I teach horse owners to become the advocate for the horse living in the human world. I simplify concepts and, and ideas into fundamentals because I believe knowledge is the power. I hate complexicating things. And it's one of the words, it's not in the dictionary, it's one of the words I use, where people try to make things more complicated than they really need to be. And so I talk fast. Uh, my wife is constantly asking me to slow down. Uh, but it's kind of hard to slow down because I'm flat out excited about this stuff. I want you to become a, a better uh, person to discuss these things with um, with people. Um, and I think these webinars are really cool. And most of you know this, but when I'm done, it takes about a day to get everything straightened out, edited, and put on. But the recording will be available at horsetalk.com forward slash. Um, no. <laughs> the horseadvocate.com forward slash horse talk. Uh, all the webinars are always there. You can um, have access to them uh, anytime. Uh, so let me talk to you about the crew. This is my crew. Um, my wife there, Kathy, she's sitting across from me right now. My son, Matt, is not with us today. He is on the other side of the planet enjoying life, scuba diving in the Pacific. And that's just something he likes to do. And I'm uh, grateful that he's always there to try and help me put out these advertisements and help with marketing. But he's uh, but we are the trusted source of information. Um, although sometimes you'll look at us and maybe we shouldn't be trusted uh, because we are a little bit crazy. Um, there's, uh, there I am with my uh, horse's skull and my wife is holding two of the three books that I've written. And um, that's me taking my son's head off uh, with glee apparently. Um, but we're on Facebook as well as the other social medias. And uh, I'd love for you to go onto the Facebook the equine practice. I think it's called equine practice without the word the. Just equine practice, facebook.com forward slash equine practice. And become a member there because that's where we get all our announcements out. But seriously, we are a team um, and we rather bring all this information to you and make you uh, a better horseman. Okay, now a quick note to Kathy. Um, I said I could see the chats, but I can't. 
and do the presentation at the same time. So if you see something that comes up, and guys, if you've got any questions, just give a holler out uh, and say, hey, could you stop and explain that a little bit better or um, anything else you might have. And my wife will raise her hand and I'll go and figure out what you guys are trying to ask about. So I've organized eye problems into five basic topics. Um, but I want you to know that this is not a complete textbook on eye problems. And have all eye problems looked at by a veterinarian. I really can't emphasize that enough. Uh, you do it yourself first. I understand I, you know, a lot of people can't get a, a vet out there, but eyes are a little bit different. And I want you to understand that a veterinarian has seen at least one more eye than you've ever seen. I guarantee you they have. They've gotten training. They've gone to class. They know what these things are all about. And it's really important. Um, what are we experience to look at it? Because eye problems are not complicated, but we fear them because they are the windows into the soul. And this means a lot to me. Uh, they really are. And I'm going to be going into the anatomy, and you're going to understand what I mean by windows into the soul. Okay, the five groups are trauma, inflammation, degeneration, blindness, and blocked tear ducts. Um, the trauma is pretty straightforward. It's going to take up at least 80% of what we're talking about. Uh, the saloon is, is really uh, cranking here. They've got a birthday party going on. Um, they just brought us our dinner, which obviously I can't eat now because I'm talking, and maybe in an hour I could eat it. So um, we're just going to keep talking to you guys, and uh, sorry for the interruption. The inflammation is going to take a little bit less, um, degeneration a little bit less, blindness even less, and blocked tear ducts is a real quickie for you. So I just want to let you know um, that we're going to be moving fast to understand it. All right, this is your brain. And I know it doesn't look like your brain because um, your brain is probably a lot prettier than this. But the brain isn't um, represented by this circle. Uh, Kath, can you see my, my indicator there at all? It gets, it gets really slow, small. Yeah. Um, but the optic nuclei are represented by the blue and the green dots. And you have one on the left side, one on the right side. What's really cool is during embryology, these little optic nuclei punch out two little sensors, which we call eyeballs. And out of the, each optic nucleus comes two sets of nerves. And one goes to the left side of the eye, and the uh, left side of each eye, and the other one goes to the right side of each eye. And they share responsibilities, and they cross over in a big X pattern here. That's pretty obvious. You can see the blue and green lines cross, and it's called the optic chiasm for all these guys, guys who really want the technical terms. But these create the retinas, and the retinas are the sensory parts. So if you could understand that eyeballs are nothing more than sensors, no different than uh, thermal sensors on your fingers or pressure sensors or any other sensor that's out there, your smell, whatever, they're very unique, and all they do is they pick up light. But light just can't can be bomb, can, cannot just bombard into the skull. It needs some structure to focus that light to create an image that we understand. But this is like the film in the back of the camera, what you're seeing right here. And the brain is a computer that takes all this information and puts it together. And when you see that how short the distance is between your eyeball and your brain, you really now understand why the eyes are the window to the soul. I'll also tell you a little interesting thing, that the bigger the eyes and the wider set they are in the, in the horse's head or the person's head will indicate uh, intelligence levels um, and capacity to learn of the horse. So the more closer they are together or the smaller the eye, in other words, pig eyes, an eye that looks like it belongs to the pig that's sitting in your horse, they can become a little bit more difficult to work with. And that's because they're direct extension of the brain. So I drew this yellow uh, curve on the very outside part of the retinas, and that's your cornea. The cornea is the clear part. You don't have to remember all these names. You just know that there's a clear part to everybody's eye, and that's what contains everything inside of it. Because here's a side view of it. The yellow is the cornea, the clear part. And then you have the blue and the green coming in, which is a mixture of all the different sensors, which we might know as rods and cones, that pick up the black and white light and pick up uh, ultraviolet light, pick up colored light, and give us all that information. And the sclera is represented by the black line, and that's the white or the pigmented part of the eye that kind of holds everything together into a globe shape. It's a fibrous structure. It's very tough and very hard to get through. Here is a picture of an eyeball, 
And I've got two uh, red arrows. Let's look at the top one where it says the white sclera covered with a thin tissue filled with blood vessels. Well, that thin tissue can be pigmented. So there's a lot of horses out there that have a dark eye and you can't see the white. And some horses don't have pigment and then you see the white of the eye. And that's one of those misconceptions where a horse, when you see the white of their eye, it just means that the eyelids have opened up wider and they're looking at an eyeball. Um, and in that particular case, there's um, um, no pigment covering it. But you can see all the blood vessels on the side and they come right up to the edge of, between the sclera and the, and the cornea. And, and they stop right there. And this pretty much feeds everything. But the clear cornea, which you can see in this lower uh, arrow, uh, is, is absolutely crystal clear. It, it, it just doesn't have any problems in it. You can see right through it. And through that uh, clear lens, uh, cornea, you're going to see a lens. And I've represented it as a um, cross section. And the lens helps to focus the light that comes through the cornea and brings it onto the lens. So it helps us, just like the lens of a camera, to um, change the angles of the, of the light beam so it comes in. Now, a lot of you want to know what the problems of the eyes are. Well, you can't understand the problems of the eye until you get a little bit better uh, look at the anatomy. And in the next uh, picture, I've added the iris and the pupil. So the iris is this brown thing that I have uh, on the top going straight down and on the bottom going straight up. And it doesn't come all the way across. And that's because this space is necessary for the light to actually come through. And that's represented by the red arrow. The light comes in through the pupil and through the lens and onto the back of the eyeball. Now, <clears throat> this iris is filled with muscles and blood vessels. And those muscles can cause this to open up uh, and become dilated or close up and become uh, constricted. And that's just like a diaphragm of a, of a, of a, a camera. Uh, the wider it gets, uh, the more light that can come in. It's probably darker outside. Okay, you can see in this same picture that I showed you before, the brown area that goes around the eye is called the iris. Now, what's really cool is, um, the horse has an oval. You know that you and I have very round pupils, and that's represented by the uh, lower arrow here. Um, and cats have vertical slits go up and down. And uh, aliens, of course, if you guys watch anything with aliens, they can have all sorts of different eyes. Uh, <laughs> but um, it seems like every depiction of any eye anywhere always has some sort of diaphragm to regulate the amount of light that comes in on the back of the eye. And that's what this is all about. So let's look at the eye straight on, and this is a uh, cross-section. The, the yellow circle represents the cornea, and then this brown squiggly line around here is the iris, and the pupil is the open in, in, uh, part in the middle. And I added something called the corpora nigra, which is unique to the horse, and it's a big, massive, I don't know, stuff here on the top edge of the, of the pupil, right on the border, and it's part of the iris. And some people uh, think that that acts like a sun visor. So it's just like wearing a baseball cap with a sun visor. And these horses spend most of their time with their head on the ground. Um, and the sun is coming down onto their eyeballs. And they just need a little bit of a visor there just to keep the sun off their eyes. That's what a lot of people think it is. I haven't heard anybody say anything else. I don't think anybody's proved anything what the Corpora Nigra is. But you need to know that it's normal. Uh, the corpora nigra is easily seen on the top edge. Unfortunately, the flash has a big white uh, circle on it, but that's that shadow that you see on the top edge. But there's a, some horses that have the corpora nigra also on the bottom. And this is what I wanted to show you in this photograph, where you can see uh, five di different little bumps. You can see the red area pointing to one of them. This is the corpora nigra on the lower li lid, and it's no big deal. It's just uh, uh, different in some horses. Um, I also want to show you a horse that has a dilated pupil. And compared to this pupil here that's evenly um, oval, um, kind of looks like a, the track and field at, at the Rio Olympics uh, last month, and here it looks more circular. And this is a horse, interesting enough, that was wide-eyed with fright. And you can see in the reflection the bright windows and it's broad daylight out. Now, when a horse is 
uh, receiving little light because it's dark out, this, this pupil will automatically open up. But it's also under another control, not just light, but how sensitive they are to uh, something that's occurring in their environment. And in this case, uh, this horse was scared. Um, and, and, and I knew that this is a horse that always needs to be medicated to get its teeth loaded. Uh, it turns itself inside out. And so when I started working with it, I noticed his pupils became dilated and it's, it's uncontrollable. And I actually came back 45 minutes later uh, to take another picture of this and the pupil was still dilated. So this is what they mean by wide-eyed with fright. It means the pupil becomes dilated, not the whole eyeball, but the pupil becomes dilated. And yours does the same thing too. All right, so we're done with anatomy and I'm gonna go into the first section called eye trauma. And eye trauma can be divided into a lot of things. But I'm gonna talk about corneal ulcers because they do 90% of the problems in horses' eyes. These are so common. If you own a horse, there's a good chance that one of your horses is gonna have a corneal ulcer. And they could be called an ulcer, a scratch, a laceration, even a puncture. But the bottom line is that clear, um, solid membrane that keeps everything inside the eyeball and keeps everything that's outside, such as water and dirt and dust and bacteria and all these other things, it keeps them from coming in there. Because remember, this is a direct extension of the brain and they wanna make sure that it stays solid and healthy. But when it doesn't, one of the first signs that you get is the eye is closed, here's the lid is closed, and you can see some tears coming down the horse's face. The tears are increased in a horse that has a corneal ulcer, scratch, laceration, and puncture because it's painful and they're trying to bring the tears in there to um, bring in antibodies, which is the natural defense mechanism that the horse has to kill bacteria in there. And they're basically flushing it out just like if you had a cut, you'd flush it underwater just trying to get the bacteria out. That's what all this increased tears do. And the eye closes mainly because it's painful and it also diminishes the light that's coming in there because light itself becomes painful in these horses' eyes. But that's the first sign most horse owners see is a closed eye they don't want to see. They don't want to look out. You can take your fingers and force that eyelid open. And believe me, it takes a lot of pressure to get this eyelid open because they have very strong muscles to keep it closed. But if you do open it up, you're going to see a lot of pink swollen tissue in here. Um, that's called conjunctivitis. It can be caused by a lot of things like a foreign object in there, uh, a, a piece of uh, weed or dust or dirt that's in there. That can all cause this. But when you get a lot of pain with the, the eyes really sh uh, shut is that, at that tightly and a lot of tears, you have to figure out what's causing it. And corneal ulcers are top of the list. Now, as I open this eye even further, you're able to see that this is a more constricted pupil. In other words, the top and bottom edges are closer together. It's not oval. It looks more like flat surfaces with rounded edges. And this is telling me that there's a lot of pain. What happens is the iris uh, reacts to the corneal scratch and it constricts down. It goes actually into a spasm because it's trying to keep out much as much light as possible uh, because the light itself becomes painful. I'm not too sure why it does, but it's called photosensitive. So if a horse is got its eyelid closed, it's excessive tearing, it's got swollen red uh, membranes, its pupil is constricted, it wants to remain in the dark. That's a corneal ulcer until proven otherwise. So let me show you a little bit more about this anatomy. Here's a cross section of the cornea and there's actually three distinct layers. You have this yellow layer on the outside, which they call the epithelium. We'll just call it the outer layer so you don't have to worry about it. And you have this inner layer, which is green, called the endothelium, which we call the inner layer. And in between, they call this the stroma, or the body. And, and that's relatively thick compared to the uh, first, the inside-outside layers. And you can see this red light line indicating light. And it can pass through here because it's crystal clear. But water and dirt and dust bounce off. It can't get in. It's absolutely waterproof. Keep in mind that between the cornea and the lens down here is more water. It's called the uh, aqueous. And this water here uh, also can't penetrate in here. 
So it's bounced off. So this becomes this completely waterproof uh, object. However, when you have a scratch or an ulcer, ulcer just means a break in the membrane here, uh, or scratch or a puncture. Puncture will go all the way through. So this is just an abrasion to the outside. It gets scratched from a little piece of hay that kind of scratches it, or a fly that gets in there, or whatever causes it. They get a break in this cornea. This blue line represents water, and the water comes in and disrupts, disrupt this str stromal area. And what happens with that is now this area becomes hazy. And when you see a horse that has haziness in their eye, in addition to a half-closed lid, uh, excessive tearing, uh, red membranes, this is a corneal ulcer, absolutely proven. And what your veterinarian is going to do <coughs> is it's going, he or she is going to add a green dye. And this dye is water uh, soluble and actually comes in here and fills this little hole with bright green uh, dye. Easily seen if you use ultraviolet light because it's, um, it's, it's reactive to ultraviolet. So you darken the room, turn on the UV light, and these things light up like a Christmas tree. And this proves beyond a shadow of doubt that you have a break in the cornea and you need to get rid of this. So that's corneal ulcers in a nutshell. Just to go over some of the signs again, uh, water leaks through the outer layer and disrupts the body that, of the cornea and causes pain. That pain causes the pupil to constrict as it goes to the spasm, kind of like a, a cramp that you have in your leg. It increases the tears to protect the damaged area. These are also um, loud. The, the, the tears actually cause more edema. In other words, it's the tears that are leaking in and causing the edema. Um, and so it's like a double-edged sword, but the edema is really not that bad. It disrupts things they can't see out of it, but it actually allows the blood vessels to come in. And the lid squeezes shut out of pain to keep the light out. So we diagnose it using the water-soluble dyes. Uh, if there's damage, the stain will be bright green, especially under UV. And a lot of times you need to sedate the horse and or give pain relief applied to the cornea to help in the diagnosis. So um, uh, uh, there's a lot of vets who will put some drops on the eye that completely numbs the cornea, kind of like the dentist putting something in your gum and numbing it before they stick the needle in. You can do that too to a horse's cornea. And that allows you to open the eyeball up and take a really good look at what's going on there. Because some of these lacerations or ulcers are underneath the eyelid, and until you open it up all the way, you're never going to see it. Now, there's a lot of other diseases out there that can call cause the same signs. And so you, the best thing, and I put in bold here, call a veterinarian, those uh, eyes, uh, not your local um, fish veterinarian, but horse veterinarian, uh, even a dog and cat veterinarian and a human ophthalmologist have a lot of understanding how these work because most eyes are the same. Um, there's some unique things in certain species, but you need to get veterinarians to look at this, stain the eye, make sure that it's a corneal ulcer because you need to know exactly what's wrong to determine the correct treatment. Because each treatment for each disease can be different. And if you use the wrong treatment, you can actually be harmful to the eye. In other words, you may be not be helping it or you may make things worse. The most important part of the treatment is to reduce pain. Um, that can be done either topically or systemically, meaning systemic, you can give the horse bute or banamine um, and make the horse comfortable, just like you take an aspirin or um, uh, any other non steroidal anti inflammatory. That works really well. But then we put some topical uh, things on there, ointments or liquids, to help uh, reduce the pain. But I want you to understand the basic principle of this no treatment applied to the horse will cure the scrape. Nothing cures the scrape. Only the horse can cure the scrape. It's his innate ability to bring those edges together bring the materials needed to repair it, and get all the edema pumped out and bring the cornea back to normal. It's up to him. All we're trying to do is to uh, make this work by uh, keeping dirt out, keeping the horse comfortable, and allowing things to work with maybe some supplemental antibiotics to fight off some of the infections. That's all we're doing. All right. Now, atropine is the number one treatment as far as I'm concerned. Now, some other vets may disagree with this, but as far as I'm concerned, atropine is the most important. This paralyzes the iris into an open position. So in other words, the iris is constricted down into spasms like a cramp in your leg. And if you could immediately make a cramp go away from your calf or your thigh, you'd be grateful. 
And by paralyzing the iris, it immediately gives pain relief and it's safe and effective. It can be used on any eye disease, no matter what the cause is. That's what's so cool about atropine. It eliminates the painful spasms from the iris no matter what. It also, because of this, prevents adhesions between the top and bottom edges of the iris or the attachment of the iris to the lens, both caused by inflammation. Both can lead to partial and even full blindness. So we really want to eliminate that. So adding atropine to any horse that has a pupil that's constricted with pain is going to eliminate pain and prevent future problems that's going on. I doubt if anybody's going to argue with me on, on the use of atropine, but I will really stress to use it minimally. I always told my clients to use one, maybe two doses. And as soon as you saw the pupil dilated, stop using it. Because a lot of horses um, will have their pupil remain dilated for days, up to a week, with just one or two treatments. They're that sensitive. There have been some reported cases and some vets who believe that if you give too much atropine, you can actually cause the horse the colic. And I guess that's true. I've never seen it, but I've always told people to never use more than what's necessary to get the pupil dilated. And it could be one, maybe two, maybe three treatments at most, and that pupil is going to be dilated and the horse is going to be comfortable. And after a day or so of, of treatment, these horses usually are, are on the road to recovery. But uh, there are so many different eye treatments out there, especially in the human world. Tetracaine? Yeah, um, there are, are different. I used, um, um, there's a special ophthalmic um, uh, drops that I used to use on eyes um, that really helped these guys. And I think it did was tetracaine. So each vet is going to use what they think works. And there's more and more uh, things out there to help these, these horses. Okay, antibiotics. <clears throat> Always use them on the advice of your veterinarian. Most broad spectrum antibiotics do work, uh, but I've also seen some disasters with unusual organisms. I personally had um, uh, one of my clients' horse. I uh, did everything right. I stained it. There's a corneal ulcer. I put atropine in. I put regular broad spectrum antibiotics on. And everybody was happy. The next morning, the people called and were freaking out. It would be an understatement. And they said the eyeball is twice its normal size. And, you know, I'm used to people exaggerating. So I went right out there. And there's no doubt, this horse was in agony. The, the eyeball had actually swollen, which is beyond my imagination. And I took the horse over to the university. And they immediately looked at it. And they said, this eyeball is coming out. There's no other treatment. So they nucleated the eye, and they cultured what was in there. And it was one of uh, six horses. No, I take that back. Six humans who had had a, a bacterial infection of this particular um, organism that was rapidly growing, and no antibiotic touched it. Um, and, and so a lot of vets will go ahead and actually try to culture and figure out what they should be using uh, for the correct antibiotics. Uh, but usually for most horses, a broad spectrum antibiotic will work. Uh, waiting to start treatment always makes things worse. Um, I can't emphasize that. I have a three-hour rule for all infections. doesn't matter whether it's skin or eye. If you let things fester for more than three hours, the bacteria have a head start, and it's really hard to start these guys. It is so important that you start as soon as possible. Uh, get your vet out there. Say, Doc, I know you can't come out for, like, half a day should you do you want me to put some antibiotics in and and almost every vet is going to say yes put the antibiotics in get that started it's really important um keep the horse in the dark uh in a darkened area try and keep away from the uh, light add anti-inflammatory such as bute banamine or prevacox and avoid stress from other horses that's really important because the horse is having difficulty seeing and if he's worried about being driven into a corner by other um, aggressive horses, he may run into something and make things worse. So try to avoid stress from other horses. Uh, steroids. A lot of eye ointments have steroids in because they're anti-inflammatories obviously are indicated for inflammation. But when you do, it allows the bacteria to grow or worse. Uh, funguses grow. And funguses are everywhere. Their spores are floating around you and me right now. And they're worse in the barn. So your eye is constantly fighting these things off with tears and eyelids working back and forth, washing them away. Um, so when you add a steroid, 
um, you're actually basically helping to suppress the horse's immune system and you can lead to much further problems, which I'll get into a little bit later. But never, ever, ever use steroids in an eye that you don't have a, have a diagnosis for. Uh, and, and so they shouldn't even be in your hands. Okay. Now, some horses need, some horses need more intense treatment. Um, usually when you see these horses, you put a little ointment in and you do it three or four times a day. Um, and that is a lot for a lot of people, especially people who have uh, one or two jobs and can't get out there. Uh, let's say you have a, a horse that you can't even administer pay, um, medication to the eyes, head shy, you're um, uh, confined to, um, you know, you've broken your leg or something, I don't know, whatever the reason is, um, or the infection has allowed to advance further, it's got a fungus infection, it's got an abscess in there or something like that, and you may need something more uh, specialized. Some hospitals are set up for this, but some people need to do this at home, and they need hourly medication throughout the day and night. So some horses are set up with these special um, uh, systems. And I remember seeing the system for the first time in the 70s. And um, as far as I'm concerned, they work. I've seen more horses that it's worked on, but I've seen a few horses that it hasn't worked on. But basically, the subpalpebral injection site is indicated with the red arrow here. That's where the medication goes through an injection uh, deal that's underneath the eye. You can't even see it here. Um, but it drips into the eye and covers the whole eyeball down here. And the tubing goes up over the pole and down the horse's neck, right along there, and to the withers. And then at the withers, you have an injection port. And <clears throat> this works in, in a lot of horses, and it's being used today. It's been around, like I say, since the 70s when somebody invented it. But the horse that I used it on back in the 70s, um, when we put it in, Every time I walked to the horse's shoulder, the horse would freak out and run away. Um, not run away, but I mean, made it almost impossible because it knew when we went to this injection port, its head was going to get a dribble of stuff on its eyeball. Um, it's one of the reasons I went to vet school, actually, uh, the horse that had this system put in, because my trainer said, grab that eye ointment and put it in that horse's eye. This is back in the 70s before I went to vet school. And I grabbed the tube of eye ointment and I went in and gave it, and the horse I gave it to was needed an antibiotic. And what I gave was steroids. And so I learned the hard way never to put steroids in a horse's eye because that horse uh, eventually lost his eye. So never, ever, ever put steroids in. But if you have to do something um, intense, there are systems set up like this. Okay, blood to the rescue. <clears throat> a lot of people are squeamish about blood, but I'll tell you one thing. Blood saves lives. And here's a cross section of the eyeball. Again, the yellow represents the cornea. And then I have the brown streaks on each side, which is the iris, with the clear spot in the middle, which is the pupil. And then I have the gray oval structure, which is the lens. And then what I have here in red are little dots and lines. And that represents blood vessels that come in here and sit on the side of the eyeball. Um, let, me, let me scroll back up and click on a picture here remember all those blood vessels here all those blood vessels are there for a reason they're ready to pounce on anything that's going to be a problem so they're sitting right here on the side of the eye and when you have a corneal ulcer out here <clears throat> or even uveitis which is inflammation inside but whatever the reason is these blood vessels start to migrate across the cornea across the clear part of the eye and also through the iris to help bring the materials needed to, to uh, fix the eyeball. The, the problem is if, this is, if the process is blocked or it's not done correctly, uh, you can end up with scars, you can end up with pigment, permanent vessels, and even blindness because of this reaction of the um, blood vessels. So that's why I call this when things go wrong. But first, it has to happen because that's when it's going right. It's when it's prolonged too long that you get some other things going on. Here's a cornea that has a, gray, a big gray area in the middle, and you can easily see this tree branch of a, a blood vessel that's come in because the clear part of the cornea has no, no supply, no root. There's no interstate system to bring materials in like we have on our planet. Uh, so they have to build the roads, if you will, and then bring things in 
which helps heal it. And then they have to suck the, the, the water out to dry things up to get rid of the edema. And as the edema goes away, these vessels actually shrink up and disappear. And in a normal process, things are really good. Unfortunately, in this particular horse, <clears throat> uh, things went wrong. And you can see some scarring tissue at the bottom at the 6 o'clock position. You can see with the red arrow coming in. It's a little bit darker. There's a lot of vessels. And this horse is probably going to end up with a permanent spot right in the middle of the eye. Um, that's always going to have this spot in here. And that, again, is from somebody who maybe took their time. The horse was out in the pasture. They didn't see it in time. And this could have been coming on its own. It's not a perfect system. It's much better to avoid having corneal ulcers. Um, so I just want to show you that. Here's another one that's even worse. And this is probably a combination of corneal ulcer and other inflammation. On your right-hand side, what I call a 3 o'clock position, you can see black pigment has been uh, deposit along with the scar tissue. And this is going to be a permanent change. This horse is always going to have that black spot. In fact, this eye is pretty well calm and done healing. And it has all these blood vessels and it's just never going to change. Also note these other two arrows on the bottom left hand side at the seven o'clock position. And I'm pointing out a couple of tags where the iris is actually adhered to the lens. And this is from just spasms and not being treated properly. And if you look carefully, um, you can see the big bright uh, reflection of my flash, but here in the middle you see a small reflection of the flash, and that's because it's bouncing off an opaque lens. This lens has basically got a cataract, so this inflammation caused the cataract, um, the lens to become uh, opaque. And so this horse is pretty much functionally blind, certainly has a much reduced vision, um, mainly because this wasn't intended to properly. And then, of course, you can have punctures where something actually goes through the eyeball, and you see this large white um, circular area that got filled in with tissue to close it off so no more stuff on the inside came out. Uh, but then you can see this huge mass of basically skin. It took skin and brought it out here and covered it up and grafted it, if you will. And that's going to be there for life. But also notice at the 3 o'clock position, that, that crescent of clear cornea. So this horse actually salvaged about a third of his eye. And he can probably see pretty well out of the side toward his nose. He can't see things coming in from the side, but he certainly can see things in front of him. And I'll bet you a dollar this horse eats just fine and lives just fine and does everything it needs just fine. So that's, that's what a horse can do if left to its own de uh, devices to heal things. We're in here just trying to make sure that we help the horse salvage the majority of the eye. All right. We're doing pretty well on time. We're just whipping through these things. I want to talk about stromal abscesses. Now, stroma just means the body. That's that part that's between the outside, outside edge of the cornea and the inside of the edge of the cornea, that brown squiggly line that I showed you. And <clears throat> what happens is bacteria gets in there, and then the outer edge closes up, and the inner edge never was broken, and that bacteria is closed in, and it's still alive, and it still grows, and it creates pus, and it's called a stromal abscess. And if you put on uh, the green dye, you're not going to see it. It's not going to stain because the outside of the eye looks good. But what's happening is on the inside, you have an infection growing. It's painful. It acts just like a corneal ulcer. And these things, you actually have to go in and scrape the outside to let the bacteria and pus come out, the antibiotics in. So you're basically treating just like any abscess, even uh, abscess in the sole of your horse's hoof. You cut it out, let the pus out, and let it grow from the inside out. That's what you're doing with these things. So <clears throat> stromal abscess is our problem. It's just an advanced case of a corneal abscess or corneal uh, ulcer that you need to do a little bit more advanced and aggressive therapy on. Uh, and those are really hard to find, actually, so you need a good vet who can go in there and find these things. The fungal keratitis, I use this word keratitis because that's what they call it. Keratitis just means inflammation of the uh, cornea. It's just a fancy way. I know it's spelled with a K instead of a C. But fungal just means a fungus gets in there. And fungal spores are everywhere. And they're an opportunistic or organism that can invade the cornea with tentacles that are difficult to impossible to win against. Once you st start to get a fungal keratitis, uh, a lot of these eyeballs 
are never salvaged. Uh, they're painful. They chronically tear. The horse is constantly having problems with them. They're itching. They're scratching. Um, at, at the best and at worst, they're just in agony. And, and the treatment for some of these guys is to have the eyeball removed. And that's called enucleation. And the nucleation looks funky. I'm about to show you a picture so you can get grossed out. Hold on. Here it comes. This is a horse with an eyeball removed. And this is one without a prosthesis, which means they just took the skin and covered it, and, and the skin actually sinks into the socket. Uh, the horses do really well with these. The pain is immediately resolved. It's just amazing. But all the pain uh, nerves are gone. The optic nerve is cut. And these guys do really well. Some people actually put a prosthesis in here, which fills this out with a uh, enlarged globe. It still looks really funky. I don't know if I would do it, but some people just can't stand looking at a socket like this. Uh, but horses that are blind with the removal of an eye usually are so grateful that the pain is gone that they say, thank you, let me keep living. <clears throat> so on their home, the horse will try to save the eye and preserve sight. Humans can help but they can also not help with good intentions. In other words, some of us interfere with the healing process by using the wrong medication or not being observant, not doing the right thing. So we really know, have to know what to do, and that's basically get on it right away, get a vet out there to help you diagnose it, and treat it aggressively as fast as you can so you can prevent all these problems that I showed you in the previous pictures. All right, we're, we're getting close. Um, to the end, I think we're doing pretty well on time. I want to talk about other traumas, <clears throat> such as eyelid lacerations and fractures. Does anybody have any questions about the corneal uh, ulcers or abrasions or anything like that? Okay, good. You're either snoozing or I'm, I'm saying it right. I'm here just to make things simple. Uh, I'm not trying to make you into veterinarians or ophthalmologists or experts. I just want you to understand some of the basics. So here's a skull, um, and you can see that around these holes in the eyes, and maybe I, maybe I just need to move this down a little bit. There we go. Um, you can see this red arrow points to this arch, and you can feel this next time you go out and pet your horse. You can feel this arch of bone. And it's a very thin arch, but it's a very hard and durable arch. Uh, but with enough trauma, this can be crushed. Um, and this helps protect the eyeball. And the fact that it got crushed just means you had a very hard blow to the head. But what's interesting is these fractures are very rare. These horses can move their head out of the way pretty quickly, um, and they can avoid trauma. But this is a fracture, a normal fracture spot for a horse. If a horse gets kicked in the head or in the face, these can crush in, and it takes a skilled surgeon to try and bring these out and keep them in the normal place um, and allow the bones to heal. Uh, I'm not a surgeon. I can't advise whether they do anything more special than that, uh, but the chance of this breaking is pretty rare. But what is really common is I see horses hit in the face without the break, and these guys, um, they, they basically have swelling, and the swelling can be in the eyelids, but what's different differentiates trauma to the head versus squeezing the lids together from cornea ulcer is obvious once you see it. So just like a, a prize box uh, fighter, you know, he gets punched in the face and his eyelid is swollen shut. He's sitting there doing the interview with half his eyelid closed. That's from trauma. His eyeball doesn't hurt. His head may hurt. He's got swelling there, but his eyeball doesn't hurt. And compare that to the eyeball squeezing shut and draining uh, fluids and being painful to open, but the whole eye isn't swollen. There's, I, I think if you can just picture those two different things, you can tell the difference between swelling from being smacked in the head or bee sting or something like that versus the cornea being uh, um, damaged. Yeah, well, uh, that's a great point. Uh, Kathy says you can have both. Just because the face is swollen doesn't mean he doesn't have cornea trauma. And what the difference is, is usually when you're trying to open up the eyelids, they just keep them squeezed shut and the membranes inside the eyeball are, are um, red and swollen. There's copious amount of tears. And if you can open those eyelids up and look, you'll see the pupils constricted. And that's the difference. But if you're just smacked in the head and the eyeball's okay, you can open those eyelids up and they don't fight you. They say, yeah, it hurts. But they aren't trying to squeeze them shut. All right. Now, here's the treatment that a lot of people can do. Keep the head elevated. Use a hay bag and hang it up high. 
Now, a lot of people say, oh, I don't like to put a hay bag up high because uh, they're worried that the horse is going to inhale uh, and get uh, dust in the lungs. But at this point, it's temporary. You just want to get the head up because if you turn the horse out on grass and let him put his nose down the ground all day long, that head is going to become more swollen. That edema is never going to come out of there. And the edema actually will move down the face toward the nose. Um, and, and you're freaking out because you're saying, oh, my God, the infection is moving or whatever. But if you keep the head up for 12, 24 hours, you're going to find that the edema goes away from the head very quickly, down the neck where it disappears, and you'll never see it again. So if you have trauma to the head where you have swelling, just keep the hay bag high, keep the horse in uh, as long as you feel comfortable or as much as possible, and you'll see that swelling goes away pretty quickly. Fractures to the bones can be heard. If you carefully palpate the area, you're going to hear a word called crepitus, which means crackling with fractured bone edges, which can make a lot of people vomit. And they make a, a vet dance up and down saying, I found it, I found it. I know, we're kind of weird. But um, also, it's also usually very painful. So as you touch it, they're pulling their head away. They don't want to be touched. And so some of these horses have to be heavily sedated to feel if there's a fracture. But most fractures, you're just going to let uh, heal on their own. And these are flat bones. These are not round bones like what you find in the legs. These are flat bones. And they will heal, but they'll usually heal with a bump. Yeah, I almost put in cold compresses here, uh, <clears throat> and I agree. Remember the old steak, you know, get the cold steak, uh, raw steak out of the fr fridge and put it on the, you know, put in cold compress I think is a great idea. If the horse is not too painful and you feel safe enough to do it, I think a cold compress is great. Some people, and I'm not too sure why, say a warm compress. I disagree. I think a cold compress and keep the head up and you'll be really happy with what you see. And always ask your vet for some help with this. Some of these horses just need some pain medication for the first 12, 24 hours to allow you to add the cold compress and make the horse feel comfortable. It's a great bonding moment for a lot of horses too. You know, if you don't freak out and you stay uh, in charge and be the leader, um, for those of you who don't know anything about that, look the old horse talks about horsemanship as leadership and you'll understand what I mean. But keep your spirits high but your energy low and these horses will come to you and basically say thank you thank you for helping me <clears throat> okay an unwanted problem for, for some head trauma and this is off the topic of of uh, eye problems but i wanted to let you know that you can have some sequela to uh head trauma if you don't get on it right away um in the cold compresses the butte um, and just good nursing care can help prevent this. But you can get uh, atrophy of, of the jaw muscles, and you can get palsy, and I'm going to show you what this is. This is palsy in a horse, um, and it's kind of a freaky picture, but uh, if you notice, the, the right ear doesn't come forward. The left ear does. This isn't a horse that has one ear back and one ear forward because it wants to. This right ear is paralyzed. It won't, close, uh, it won't come forward. The eyelid on this side is actually halfway closed. So you can see it's a little bit more open on the left, on his left, not your left, his left, but on his right, the eye is actually a little bit more closed. It's, you can see that a little bit better in life. You can see his muscles per, pull to the good side because this is the stronger unparalyzed, unparalyzed side. So this is all weak. And you see his right uh, lower lip is, is drooping. So this is classical Bell's palsy. Or uh, Horner syndrome, uh, but this can occur from trauma um, to the head, and sometimes this is temporary, and sometimes it's permanent, depending on the cause. Here's another horse that had trauma, and I want you to look carefully where this red arrow is, because if you look carefully, you'll see some ridges in here. And the reason there's ridges in here is because this is skin covering bone, and there's absolutely no muscle on the right cheek here. There's absolutely no muscle. In fact, it's replaced with scar tissue. And luckily, it didn't affect his eye. His eye works beautifully, but he cannot open his mouth. And to float this horse is nearly impossible because you can get maybe an inch separation instead of a big yawn that most horses do. He can barely open his mouth. So this is what can happen from trauma. So it's important that you get on trauma right away. These past two cases didn't talk about the eye, but uh, it's all part and parcel of trauma. Now, what's that? Uh, that horse can still eat, yes. But 
has to be uh, fed small hay cubes and has difficulty with uh, rough stemmed hay, coarse hay. All right, trauma to eyelids. I had a whole deal on uh, safety on another horse talk, and I also have a small um, Doc T horse sense five minute spiel about bucket safety and how to hang water buckets to prevent this. But the most common uh, problem or uh, uh, cause of eyelid lacerations are bucket handles that are opened up right where the, the metal handle attaches to the bucket or people put double-ended snaps with the snaps facing out. Always place the thumb snap facing in toward the wall and away from the horse's eye. Now, this is one of my pet peeves. It's one of those things that's my hot button. Good surgery can reattach eyes perfectly. I've done it a hundred times, uh, but for some reason, there are some uh, veterinarians who may not take the time to put it together, or the owner wants to do it themselves, or <clears throat> the horse is too rank, or you know whatever reason. But you have to attach these eyelids in two layers, using the finest uh, diameter suture possible. And if you do and take your time, you can put these eyelids together so there's absolutely no evidence that it was ever torn. And that's the way it should be. But if you don't allow the uh, eyelid to heal and you just let it go, you can cause abrasions of the cornea uh, from poor alignment. And let me show you a picture of an eyelid. Here's an upper eyelid that's obviously been torn apart. <clears throat> it doesn't provide the protection that this eyelid, this eye needs. It creates more exposure. So this horse has to blink a little bit harder to keep this eye covered in water. Remember, if an eyeball doesn't get water on the outside of it, it will dry up, shrivel up, and that will cause a, a chafing, which causes the erosion, which causes the ulcer, which causes all the problems. It's chronic dry eye. If you've never ever known somebody with chronic dry eye, uh, many dogs, pugs especially, can get these problems because their eyelids don't work properly. Well, this eyelid is very important for the health of the eye. And when it's halfway torn off, uh, it should be sutured back on. And, and really, even if it's on by a thread, these things can heal up beautifully if attended to quickly. So I urge you to get your... Um, veterinarian out here to to suture that eyelid up and if he brings out a rope that he took from his boat to, si to, to suture the thing up um well it's not going to work they always fall apart there's filled with pus and the eyelid ends up looking like this anyway so this has to be sutured in two layers the sutures cannot be touching the eyeball because if it does every time he blinks he'll scrape it so the first layer has to be buried inside the sub uh subcutaneous tissue and then the outer layer has to be fine fine suture material and you'll have great results of that <clears throat> all right so here's a summary for trauma before we move into uh, inflammation act quickly call your vet for an accurate diagnosis use only medications that will help your horse if in doubt don't use it keep the horse in the dark and give systemic pain relief to to keep the pain down without if, especially if you don't have any um, pain medications, keep the horse in the dark. Avoid other horses that may injure a partially blind horse because his lid is closed. And suture the torn eyelid every chance you get. All right, let's move into inflammation. Anybody got questions on that section? Cool. All right. Uh, this is a pretty bad, badly inflamed eye, uh, which is actually in the chronic state. It's not... It isn't it isn't bothering the horse. Unfortunately, if we give this horse a few more years, the uh, eyeball can actually die. Uh, it'll shrivel up. It'll become half its size. It's like um, uh, a grape that turns into a raisin, if you will. And these uh, these actually become infected, and you just have to take them out because um, they're just not working. It's what we call an end stage eye. Uh, but inflammation is basically called uveitis. And it's an immune reaction to the inside of the eyeball. And it's often called moon blindness or recurrent uveitis. But we're just going to call it uveitis right now. Let's go back to the cross section of the cornea. And remember, the outer edge is, is the, the outside layer is yellow. And the squiggly brown or pink or whatever color this is, is the body. And this green line I'm showing in a broken format. It's not solid anymore. And because it's not solid anymore, water from inside the eyeball is actually going to leak through and create this gray haze, 
which is your uh, edema, all right? So the question is, why is this green uh, line not solid anymore? And there's dozens of reasons, but I was always taught that the inside of the eye is an immunologically privileged site, which means what's inside the eyeball is not recognized as self by the immune system. And if something occurs where the uh, antibodies of the body can get in there, it's going to say, oh my gosh, we have a problem here, and we'll actually start to self-attack the eye. So it's, a, um, it's like um, any of these um, immune system diseases that the body uh, starts to attack itself, that's what seems to be happening. Some people say the damage is caused by um, a bacteria or a parasite that is actually damaging the corner of the uh, blood vessels right where the iris attaches, and that leaks uh, some of this uh, fluid in there, and the fluid has antibiotics, and the antibodies go out and say, oh my gosh, we've got this foreign object, if you will, and it starts to create a problem, and then it stops, and then it starts again, and then it stops, and that's where you get this recurring inflammation. It flares up and then goes away, and that's why a lot of people used to call it moon blindness, because they would say every time the moon became full, they'd see it more. Well, it's probably because there's brighter light then, which causes these horses to be a little bit more painful, but it's a recurring thing. And we don't know exactly why the lining of the cornea degrades, but it does. And if your horse does get uveitis, um, that's something that you have to look out for. It can happen to any horse at any time. So whenever you, oh, and the signs of it are identical cornea ulcer, with the exception that when you stain the eye, the eyeball comes back clear, it doesn't show any stain uptake. And so we move into uh, the fact that it's uveitis rather than a corneal ulcer. And this is where you want to use some steroid. Steroids are important to calm the inflammation of the uveitis. And you have to have confidence in diagnosis before you start using that. All right, here's a horse with long term uh, uveitis, and it has permanent edema of the whole eyeball. It has a corneal scar. It actually has pus inside the eyeball. Just it's all on the bottom because gravity takes it to the bottom. Uh, if this were a snow globe and you shook it, all this pus would come up and swirl around in here. Um, it probably has a cataract, which means the back of the eye, uh, part of the eye that, where the lens is, the lens has been affected. The lens has absorbed water. Uh, the iris is probably non-functional, meaning it's got adhesions and doesn't uh, open and close anymore. And certainly this horse is blind in this eye. But most likely it's not painful because if you look at the eyelids of this horse, they look comfortable and relaxed. And he was comfortable and relaxed. So this is an eye that's gone through the uveitis. At the point of time that I took the picture, it wasn't in a flared up state. And the horse is living comfortably with it. This horse, you can take the eyeball out or leave it. It makes no difference to this horse, but he's virtually blind in that eye. And you have to be careful working on his right side. Now, I said uveitis can occur in any horse, and the treatment is steroids. But there's another uh, um, disease of eyes that a lot of people get confused, and that's called night blindness. Now, these usually, they're common in Appaloosas, and it's also associated with lack of vitamin A. Um, and so these are horses that are probably debilitated or Appaloosas and have that pale eye. This horse does not have it. But I just want to throw a picture of an Appaloosa. You can see the mottled uh, areas and the pink skin around here. And these type of horses are more susceptible to night blindness. But you're not going to see a squinted eye. You're not going to see a half-closed eye. In night blindness, what happens is when the sun goes down, the the retina just doesn't work anymore. It doesn't pick up low light situations. And you'll see the horse run into things, um, uh, a post, the side of the, the door to the stall. Um, you put a bale of hay on the ground and you walk the horse and the horse walks right into it and almost falls on his face because he just doesn't see it. A lot of these night blind horses, the blindness comes on so uh, slowly that they accommodate, they listen for cues, they listen for pasture mates, and they basically are not that active. In daylight, they're fine, they can see beautifully. There's nothing wrong with the eyeball itself. It's the transmission of light through this eyeball to the brain where things go awry. And night blindness has nothing to do with a uveitis or corneal ulcers, and it's a combination being genetic 
um, and nutritional or both. One of the things you can remember about night blindness is remember that N in night blindness is like N in nutritional. And that's why you can remember that night blindness is nutritional versus uveitis, which is not, is inflammation. All right, let's talk about some cataracts. This, we're heading into the de degeneration part. And the degeneration could be uh, considered night blindness too. I really don't know the etiology, which means I don't know how it happens. Um, and I'm sure somebody smarter than me who looks at a lot of eyes could probably give you some more theories on this. But all I know is make sure that you feed your horses correctly, make sure they get all the vitamins and minerals they do from sunlight, from good food, uh, from uh, good supplements, and, uh, and do the best you can. But if it's genetic form, it's genetic, and please don't breed these horses. All right, cataracts. Here's a horse that it's really hard to see, but in this light, you can see the flash uh, spot there, but you can see a almost solid blue color in the pupil. All right, this is the horse with all those uh, corporate Niagara's on the bottom, but the lens behind, that sits directly behind the uh, iris, looks opaque. And this is a horse with a corneal, uh, pardon me, with a cataract. And cataract just means a degeneration of the lens, so instead of it being clear, it is now cloudy. Now, this is an interesting one, and I obviously could see this with my naked eye, um, and you see these circular rings, I call them concentric or annular rings around here. Believe it or not, this is fairly common in horses, and when I see it, I don't make a big deal out of it. I don't know how well they can see, um, but they've got them in here, and uh, when I see them, I just say, okay, the horse has annular rings, and I make a note of it. Uh, usually the owner doesn't notice any problems with this horse, but those are the annual rings. If you look in your horse's eye and you see them, you'll just say, okay, the horse is getting a little bit older and that's what's going on. It's like an age related thing and I don't make a big deal out of it. However, if you look in a horse's eye and you see this galaxy of stars, and, and I hope you guys can hear me okay because it's really growing loud outside. I think they're hanging out. Um, but uh, here you see this uh, galaxy stellar appearance. This is a horse that's obviously had inflammation inside his eye in the past. And um, this horse is becoming blind, partially blind, or possibly fully blind, at least in his ability to see objects clearly. This is like you trying to look at the world through wax colored, wax paper. You just, you know it's light out, but you just can't see anything. And that's what's going on with this horse's eye. Again, you don't need anything but your naked eye to see these uh, cataracts. All right, can't really tell you more about cataracts other than uh, they do not do surgery on them in adult horses. There's been some successful surgeries on foals born with cataracts. Uh, it's not that common, but when they do, um, some surgeons have been able to get in there and replace them by removing the lens actually and making these horses do fine without the lens in there. But every time you go into a horse's eye, and remove these lenses, whether you disrupt them, blast them, suck them out, whatever they do with corneas, pardon me, with lenses now, um, the reaction is usually wild, and these horses do not do well. And I don't know of anybody right now who's doing cataract surgery in horses at all. Uh, if that changes, please leave a note here, let me know. Uh, but right now, if your horse has cataracts, he's got cataracts, and it's end stage. There's nothing you can do about them. Neoplasia, or, or, uh, which is a fancy word for tumors or cancer, can affect the eye in any part. Here it's affecting um, part of the third eyelid. Um, actually, in this horse, this is actually part of the sclera. It's not part of the third eyelid. Uh, I don't know what it was, but it's been here for a long time, and the owner's not concerned about it. The veterinarians looked at it and says, we're just going to watch it. I believe this horse is 23. 5, 26, something like that. So we're just going to watch it. Obviously, it's not affecting the eye. It's not tearing. It's not closed. So they're not worried about it. So that's basically um, a tumor, which just means an unusual growth, and we don't worry about it. But there's all sorts of different tumors that can occur. Uh, melanomas, the eyelids. You'll see lumps and bumps that are on the eyelids. You see squamous cell with a pink skin involving any part of the eye. Squamous cell is not a good cancer, and you need to get rid of it and you need to ask your vet how to take care of it because uh, some vets uh, either leave it alone depending on the age of the horse or they freeze it or they uh, remove it surgically. Uh, some of them actually inject it if it's a sarcoid. Um, so you have to know what the tumor is 
and then you have to, some have to have a biopsy done. But uh, neoplasias basically are rare in horses' eyes, and they usually are not a problem. But when they are, you need a vet who knows what they're doing, and oftentimes these are referred to ophthalmologists who know exactly what to do with these things at a referral center. So if you see anything that's not normal, uh, if you see something like this, have your vet take a look at it, even biopsy it, and see what's going on. Uh, this is actually called a, a, a melanoma. Uh, I don't know if I'd call them melanoma because melanoma is always the black skin, but this was actually biopsied and it came back as a melanoma, which blew my mind. Um, but they're looking at this and again, watching it because any uh, surgery done to this part of the eye is gonna affect the lid uh, you're going to get chronic draining down here. This horse already has chronic draining, as you can see, with the debris and matted hair in this area. So it already is a problem. And I'd love to know what they do with this horse. Uh, but as in my practice, what I do, taking care of horse's teeth, I oftentimes uh, don't get good follow-up on these guys. Okay, now I'm going to go into the last subject. We've been here for an hour and five minutes, and that's the block nasal lacrimal ducts. I love talking about these things because, believe it or not, a lot of people don't even know that this occurs, and it's such a simple thing to take care of. Here's a horse that its eye looks really comfortable. It's open. There's no constricted pupil. All the pink looks good. But if you, what? If you look at the corner of this eye, uh, right where the third eyelid is, you see the lake of fluid here. And the fluid is spilling over and draining down the cheek right here. Now, if this was a foreign object in here, like a piece of hay that was stuck in there or a dead fly or anything, this eye would be half closed. But it's not. It's wide open. It's coming down. And if you look at the other side, um, there's no drainage there today, but you can see this dark spot and it shows that there's been some drainage here in the past. So with blocked nasal lacrimal ducts, um, the tears overflow usually in both eyes. Uh, it can be predominantly in one, but it's, it, can be, it sh can be in both. Whereas if they had a problem with one eye, you would have just tearing out of one eye and the other eye would be fine. It's usually acute if it's a foreign object in there. But here, this is more chronic tearing and what people don't know is, let me go back to this picture. Right here in the corner of the eye are two little holes. And through those two little holes is where all these tears go. And the tears go right down a tube that's built right into the skull, right down the face, and it comes out right there in the, in the nose. And you can see the fingers are holding up the um, nose and opening it up and you can see the pink spot and there's always a demarcation between the pink and the pigmented area and right inside the pigmented area you're going to see that little slit that dark slit now let me show you the other side you can actually see it a little bit better you see that hole right there that's the nasal lacrimal duct opening and that tube goes straight on up to the corner of the eye and what we do as veterinarians is we put a tube right in here and it's very ticklish. And it's one of the few times I actually have to twist the, the nose of the horse just to distract them. Um, and I get the tube in there and I, and I plug it up and I plunge a, a saline with a little bit of steroid and it comes right back out these holes here. It's called back flushing. Anybody who's ever back flushed a radio and radiator in their car knows what's happening. It takes whatever's blocked in there and pushes it out. And oftentimes I'll see coming right out of the corner of the eye here, an actual plug up to an inch long of gelatinous material that comes out. And once it comes out, it erupts with fluid that I'm pushing in from the syringe down by its nostrils. When it does come out, the horse usually jumps up like I've smacked him in the head. It's kind of funny. It's like, just relax. Don't worry. It's just boom. And then everybody's happy. And then I follow up for a couple of days with some steroid ointments in here. So the steroid ointment can drain down and clear up the uh, nasal lacrimal duct all the way down there. But if you're in doubt, if you look here, you'll see that this, this one, see how dry this hole is? That just means that the tears are not coming through there. And then you should always have a little bit of dribble coming out of there. All right, I've taken up enough of your time. Let's do the take home points. I love this horse. Look how clear that eye is. That's a normal eye. That's the way an eye should look at, look like. Okay, always look at the eyes and look for symmetry. Any lack of symmetry, if one eye is halfway squinted, just lightly squinted, is um, looks doesn't look the same as the other, the pupil doesn't look right, it usually means you got a problem. Act quickly and call your vet for help. Say, I know it's Sunday. 
well, my horse has an eye problem. I need you to take a look at it, and that vet should come. If you're unable to get help, it's okay to go with systemic eye inflammatory, um, anti-inflammatory, such as bute or banamine. It's okay to put a topical ointment in it with an antibiotic, but never put a steroid ointment in an eye uh, if you don't know what the what's going on in there. And one dose of atrophy and ophthalmic ointment is okay. So if you want to put together a little emergency kit because you're out on a trail ride or someplace uh, you don't have good vet coverage, um, an antibiotic, atropine, and some butyrbanamine um, can really help these eyes. I do also want to put in here, and I don't have this written down, but a lot of people with horses with uveitis that have chronically inflamed eyes and they want to keep them dark, a lot of them will put fly, uh, fly masks on and patch up the eye that's affected. Sometimes they put a cup, but what you don't know is around the eye is a a ton of sweat glands and you cover this up in the heat and this whole area gets just stinky it just gets like wearing a, a t-shirt outside and leaving it there and getting all smelly so what i suggest you do is get a nice face mask you know one of those fly masks that come over here and then create a uh, a patch made out of uh, blue jeans some old blue jeans that you get and make a square see how square this picture is just make a square about that big and put it right over the eye and only so the top border. So the three, the bottom and the two sides are free to flap forward. So when his head is up, it's covering it. And yes, he's blind in that eye, but he can see out of the other. Just like if you put your hand up in front of your eye right now, it doesn't bother you. But as he goes down, the flap pulls away and he can look down and he can see the grass. He can see where his feet are. He can see down. He just can't see out. It keeps the sun off of it. It keeps the air circulating through here, and it does really well. So a little patch of old blue jeans that you got, <laughs> they're singing happy birthday now outside there. So happy birthday, whoever it is. Okay. And you guys who don't know it, I come here because they have high-speed internet. I don't have that at home, so I have to come here and broadcast. Okay. Uh, treating an eye problem without an accurate diagnosis can lead to problems. Self-treating is always second best, a good veterinary exam, but all our help can't fix things. Always look to prevent trauma. Deworm regularly and feed well. Look for nails that are hanging out. Look for thumb snaps in our face the same way. Look for exposed edges that a horse is itching his face, will suddenly catch his eyelid and tear it or damages his eyeball. Look at that uh, really bad hay that you got that's really stocky and make sure that he has access to, to it. It is not jammed packed into a small container that he has to stick his head into because they can poke his eye and create some problems. Okay, I'm all done here. I want to advise you again, uh, advise you, suggest to you that you go to horseadvocate.com today and become a member. Um, and it's memberships free, and you're also going to get my 10 irrefutable laws of horsemanship that I use every day to help connect with horses. And of course, you can go to the equinepractice.com forward slash books, where you can actually buy the book itself, stick in your back pocket, and have it with you. Um, and I've got a couple other books there that if you want to purchase my autobiography and true stories of a horse vet, if you want to do that too. And finally, I want to remind you that on October 2nd, which is the first Sunday in October, I'm going to have wound healing and proud flesh in horses. And this is a really fun topic for you to understand how to prevent proud flesh because it's usually us that cause it. So I'm opening up to any questions that you guys have and, um, Say again. Oh. oh, yeah. You know, babies will just do that. Babies do that all the time. Um, babies just get in the way. Um, it's so frustrating because, um, you know, you just look at some of these babies and say, you look like trouble. Sure enough, they are. If you have a full... Um, Sometimes adding a little Valium instead of just uh, Sedatium really works well on these guys, especially if they haven't been handled much. That's just one of those little secrets that um, I've found out over the years. Valium works, Valium works great on foals for uh, working on their head. Uh, Dormostan is a great painkiller for working on the eyelids uh, or the ears or any place on the outside of the head. It's lousy for doing dentistry, but for those of you who are going to be sewing up an eyelid, um, it works really well. 
I remember sewing up one eyelid and the girl was standing there holding her horse and I looked at her and I said, are you okay? And she says, yeah, I'm fine. And I'm like, you're not fine. I didn't say it, but then she just kind of collapsed in the heap on the floor. So again, eyes and eyelids and anything about the eye can really freak out people. And what I'm saying is you don't have to freak out. Eyes and eyelids are very easy to understand and, um, and they're very uh, simple to take care of. All you have to do is, um, I don't know, just keep your own head, be, be careful, and uh, try to prevent these things from occurring in the first place. Okay, well, listen, I'm glad you guys are here. I'm glad you guys showed up. I appreciate all your time. Um, I'm going to call it a night. Tomorrow is Labor Day. A lot of you have uh, fun, uh, excitement, um, but Melissa and I are going out working tomorrow, taking care of some horses' teeth. Um, and thanks for all showing up. I wish y'all good night. Thanks.